uh, the topic is uh, our explorations with open source guest firmware for confidential VMs, right? And essentially, uh, we want to drive the agenda as follows. Uh, we want to talk about what in-guest system firmware means for virtual machines, right? Uh, it is often uh, uh, a neglected topic because it's not uh, you know, top of mind for people when they're deploying VMs, uh, especially in cloud environments, uh, what their in-guest system firmware is. Right. Uh, we would like next talk about confidential VMs and TCB. Uh, it's an up and coming uh, sort of uh, world where uh, confidentiality and VMs is being offered by, uh, is being announced by multiple cloud providers, right? And uh, seems to be the future. So we want to really investigate what it means, what the, what the TCB looks like. And obviously uh, the, the main topic of our day, which is the OSS open source guest firmware for confidential VMs. And we would like to talk about our explorations and what we have been uh, looking at that. Uh, we obviously have a demo at the end. Uh, to showcase what we have done, right? Uh, so typically, when uh, oh, so let's talk about the in-guest system firmware. Uh, typically, when we think of VMs, we think of just uh, an application running on top of an OS uh, in a VM uh, on top of a hypervisor, which uh, uh, abstracts or virtualizes the hardware, right? And this is largely how people view it architecturally, and it makes sense. Uh, but if you drill down deeper, and especially for scenarios where you're deploying IS VMs, uh, you'd realize that there are a lot more components in the mix, uh, and then one of them is just system firmware, right? Uh, so system firmware in this case could be legacy BIOS or UFI, uh, and the main purpose of system firmware is to act as bootloader for the operating system in the guest, uh, as well as provide uh, potentially some runtime services, right? Um, with the introduction of UFI, right, security features have been introduced for physical machines, and the same is applicable and applied for VMs. So uh, you know, just as uh, you would have uh, features such as secure boot and measured boot for physical machines, VMs can have secure boot and measured boot. And similarly, a physical machine might re rely on a physical TPM for its hardware root of trust. Uh, a VM rely on concept of virtual TPMs to establish trust. Right? And so these are just standard concepts which exist on VMs. Uh, just a quick note of uh, VM and support in UFI. Um, uh, 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 UFI support in the cloud, right? So almost all major cloud providers at the moment uh, do support UFI in the cloud. Uh, a lot of it was geared towards compatibility uh, to allow for ease of transition from on-premise workloads such as VMs and machines in the on-premise environments to the cloud. Uh, lately, a lot of uh, recent announcements have been made around security. Uh, some cloud manufacturers have actually announced products. Uh, others have made announcements with the uh, uh, proposed plans for products this year. Um, and these are around uh, things such as secure boot to protect against root kits, root kits and boot kits, uh, uh, do things such as enforced driver signing, uh, obviously measured boot, uh, which avoids, uh, which provides attestation uh, and boot integrity monitoring, right? So these, is, these are you know, technologies which have been around for a while, uh, now available for deployments in the cloud, right? But there are new things coming on the horizon, right? And specifically uh, confidentiality. Right. So let's start talking about confidentiality and confidential VMs. Um, with confidential VMs, the actual vision is to actually introduce a new security boundary between the VM and the underlying hosting environment. Right? <clears throat> uh, this means we would like to isolate and protect the entire VM state, which could include the VM CPU, the VM's memory, even its persistent state, such as disks, from the hosting environment, uh, which can include the host admin, the host operating system, and the hypervisor. Uh, just as any other confidential TEE, CVMs also have a notion of attestation, right? Um, and so that basically implies we would like to reflect the identity and integrity of the CVM, the confidential VM, and the identity and integrity of the hardware in a remotely verifiable report generated by CPU, right? And so this is the core fundamentals of CVM uh, uh, or the vision of CVM. Uh, if you look at the technology landscape and what's on the horizon, uh, we have AMD Sev S and P. Uh, uh, you know, AMD has been going through uh, several uh, feature releases, starting with Sev um, and beyond. Uh, Sev S and P is where they have full memory encryption and integrity guarantees, and we think it's potentially ideal for something like a confidential VM. Uh, Intel has also announced and public documented their trusted domain extensions or TDX, um, and which can be used to offer concepts of confidential VMs. Uh, 
now as we go and look through what the confidential VMs looks like, uh, you know, it's interesting to consider what the trusted computing base is for the confidential VM, right? And so if you look at it, uh, essentially we're trying to isolate from the hosting environment, which means everything in the in the VM, so everything inside the confidential VM is part of TCB, uh, and the hardware is part of TCB, right? Uh, additionally, any services which you might rely upon, uh, such as uh, attestation services or key managers to onboard keys and secrets to a confidential VM, may also be part of your TCP. Um, if you start drilling down to the core TCP components and the uh, TCP software, we would start looking at things such as, well, like we uh, pointed out, system firmware, right? And so our system firmware becomes very interesting because until now, system firmware, the choice of system firmware may not have been interesting for standard VM deployments, even though you know uh, users should be aware of what they're deploying in their VMs. In the, con in the case of CVMs, it is part of TCB, needs to be reflected in attestation and becomes very important, right? Uh, obviously there are other components in the CVM like the guest operating system, applications, uh, agents and configurations, right? Uh, so a question might come up, why are we uh, highlighting system firmware specifically? Well, that's because, uh, you know, typically users when they're deploying their VMs uh, do have tendency or do have the option of choosing the operating system. They can choose the kernel, potentially their distro. They choose their applications and agents and configuration. But system firmware can get tricky because it can be a contract between the, the users and the hosting environment. Right? And so system firmware and auditability and availability, uh, uh, availability of choices for system firmware become interesting. System firmware choices can also get interesting when you think of component dependencies, right? So if a system firmware uh, is based on UFI and is offering a, a feature such as Secure Boot, it might pull in component dependencies like virtual TPM. Right? This virtual TPM now also needs to be isolated and protected. And in fact, in this case, needs to be isolated from both the hosting environment as well as the core CVM to offer its actual guarantees. Um, of course, it also has to be different in attestation. And similarly, uh, additional dependencies might come in, such as service dependencies, right? So if a system firmware, let's say again, has a virtual TPM, it relies upon, and the virtual TPM tries to maintain some persistent state, that might uh, rely on keys managed by a key manager. And so your TCB potentially increases based on the choice of system firmware and the configuration of system firmware, right? And so uh, that's the, mainly the reason why we want to focus on system firmware as a initial start for uh, uh, ensuring confidentiality and um, uh, auditability, uh, auditability requirements for CVMs, right? Uh, and so if you look at the system firmware, essentially it's the foundation of your VM. It's the first ent 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 entity which runs inside the VM um, and uh, it's uh, the core of your TCB. Uh, why system firmware is interesting is also again because it's often disregarded, uh, often something which is left to the hosting uh, environment uh, to pick, uh, to enable a uh, scenario or, uh, or a, uh, a workflow, but not something which the user makes an uh, explicit choice about, right? And like I said before, system firmware impacts your TCB in other ways, such as you know the component dependencies and service dependencies, which can make things interesting. So with that, uh, let's start talking about the CVM uh, system firmware and what will be the core tenants of uh, you know, requirements around it, right? So let's look at uh, what do we think about the ownership and management of system firmware. Right? So who should be responsible to build the firmware? Who is responsible to validate the firmware? Should it be the CVM owner deploying the VM or should it be the hosting environment, uh, which potentially may make the firmware available? Uh, now, in this case, you know, we don't necessarily think that uh, the CVM firmware needs to come from the owner of the VM just because the firmware's purpose is to act as blue code. It's basically a ramp uh, to allow for the guest operating system to run uh, and compliant with the hosting environment's requirements as well, right? And so uh, we do still believe that the hosting environment does have a part in building the firmware, validating the firmware, and then qualifying the firmware for a VM's deployment. But the next topic gets interesting. Who chooses the firmware? And more importantly, who updates the firmware, right? And so uh, this is where, if you look at the state of the art or the status quo, uh, you know the the, uh, the currently the, the choice of firmwares is limited or non-existent. Uh, if you look at the cloud providers, uh, they may 
or may not allow you to even choose the uh, firmware for a particular deployment. And so this is where we think innovation can be uh, added into the industry, where a list of qualified firmware or firmware versions can be made available to users to make some informed choices about what's running inside, inside their VM or what's part of their TCB. Uh, now, when you talk about informed choices, the next interesting thing then becomes auditability, right? And transparency. Uh, if you want to make informed choices, you need to know what is actually running inside your firmware, right? So is the source code available? Uh, do we have reproducible bills such that we can actually, uh, such that the user or uh, the industry can validate what's running as, as the firmware um, uh, and as part of your TCB? How will this firmware be attested to, right? So how will the hardware report, which is generated for your particular CVM, uh, reflect the measurements of the firmware? And how will this be interpreted by the relying party, which consumes that uh, particular uh, report, right? So things such as attestation policies. In fact, attestation policies become even more interesting if we claim that the updates for firmware are in the ownership of uh, the hosting environment. Because you, know, you may attest for version one, but the hosting environment is up, allowed to update uh, your firmware to version two, well, your attestation policies can get tricky. Uh, and then finally, again, functionality and dependency. Not every customer uh, or every user needs the uh, features uh, which a typical firmware might have. Maybe they, they would prefer a lightweight firmware or a different variant of a firmware. That sort of concept uh, and nature of choice is not largely existent if you look at production deployments and uh, hosting environments, right? So for example, uh, does the firmware uh, intend to support features like Secure Boot? If it does, it might require a virtual TPM. Uh, if the firmware uh, intends to rely on virtual TPM, it might rely on a key manager, right? All of these choices impact the uh, trusted computing base of your confidential VM. So with that, we can start you know, uh, posturing some requirements uh, towards our design and implementation, right? So the first requirement is we should start thinking of system firmware uh, as a choice, right? And offer flavors of system firmware, right? And, you know, we don't have to have uh, too many choices. We don't want to have users confused about what they pick. Uh, we also don't want users to be able to uh, 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 to build and qualify firmware before they even do their deployment, right? Having uh, a no firmware flavors where uh, a, 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 uh, you know, for example, a firmware may have UC, secure boot, measure boot, VTPN, and a whole functionality needed for a, uh, you know, a typical IS deployment. While at the same time, another user might prefer a simplified firmware, which focuses just on measure boot and CPU based attestation with no reliance on virtual TPM uh, or virtual TPM based uh, measured boot, secure boot and features, right? And so those are choices we think uh, can be made available to uh, to uh, users deploying CVMs. Uh, the next is around uh, uh, firmware version, right? So it, we should at least allow for one firmware version, if not all, uh, to be such that user can manage their firmware, right? Uh, some custom some users might just prefer uh, having the firmware and its management handled by the hosting environment, but others who care about auditability and uh, their TCB may prefer only running uh, firmware which they have audited or uh, parties they have trusted have audited, right? And in that case, the user being able to manage their own firmware becomes interesting, right? And so those are the core requirements uh, we think uh, should be added into the industry when we talk about confidential VMs and system firmware. Um, similarly, auditability and transparency. All firmware used in VMs and confidential VMs uh, should ideally be open sourced with reproducible bills and a trail for auditability, right? Uh, and similarly, everything that is running as part of firmware and everything that the firmware depends upon should be reflected completely in attestation. These need to be the core tenants around system firmware uh, if you want to uh, have the notions of auditability and transparency uh, for things such as confidential VMs. So with that, uh, let's go into the basic design. Uh, following the design principles, uh, essentially this is what a confidential VM potentially looks like. Uh, we load a firmware, uh, depending upon the choices, this could be a lightweight firmware, right? Uh, which doesn't have any other service or component dependencies. And the firmware itself needs to be measured by the CPU hardware. Uh, what this means is the firmware's measurements, um, its potential uh, uh, hash, as well as uh, signers, if any, should be reflected as part of the hardware report. Um, 
uh, the way this works is that the firmware binary and all dependencies are loaded uh, into the memory and then the CVM initialization occurs, in which case we lock the measurements uh, and then subsequently any other report will have uh, the measurements of the firmware. Uh, to measure the, the remaining components within the confidential VM environment, which the firmware might load, uh, we introduce a concept of configuration, right? And so configuration can essentially just be a policy, uh, such as the policy around uh, 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 trusted uh, guest OS kernels. Uh, it could be direct measurements, such as a hash of the kernel or hash of the uh, init RAM FS being loaded. Um, it could be anything which reflects the uh, integrity of your confidential VM, right? And so the configuration also needs to be uh, reflected within a test station. Uh, to do that, essentially, uh, we propose two different schemes. Uh, I'll talk about them briefly in the next couple of slides. Uh, but in both schemes, essentially, the hash of the configuration is included in the CP report, either as part of a CVM's uh, init time uh, configuration, which is an, an immutable, immutable property, or uh, a tamper-proof runtime measurement register, which some CPUs can offer either directly or through some virtual implementations. Uh, for a simplified firmware design, we would also recommend that the concepts of secure boot or persistent VTPM can be dispelled with, right? And uh, we should minimize uh, external service dependencies that just potentially allows for easier auditing and transparency for these class of uh, firmware. <clears throat> now, in terms of uh, 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 in terms of the, the I mentioned two different for um, uh, measurement of the configuration. So here is uh, one scheme, right? So this relies on the concept of initialization time configuration properties, which are, are available in uh, uh, hardware TEEs, such as TDX and uh, 7SNT. So uh, in this case, the configuration or policy is presented uh, for the CVM during the pre-CVM init phase, right? So this is before even the CVM initialization has begun. Uh, during CVM initialization, the hash of the configuration is bound to the CVM such that it will be reflected in the report. The way this is done is that uh, there are properties uh, for the CVM. Uh, in the case of TDX, it is MR config ID. In the case of SEV SNP, this is host data, uh, which are set appropriately with the hash of the configuration. And post CVM init, these are locked. These are now immutable. Right, and so if you look at the report dot configuration, which essentially is the TDX or the CFSNP equivalent, those values are now locked for this instance of CVM. Uh, now, the post CVM in it, when the firmware actually runs, uh, the firmware, the first thing the firmware does, it, it gets a uh, hold of the configuration and verifies the hash of the configuration matches what will be what is bound to it as part of its attestation. Uh, if the configuration hash does not match that of its uh, attestation report. It can reject the configuration and abort. Uh, if it does match, then it can take the configuration and policy and enforce it, right? And again, to think of examples, a configuration can be uh, potentially a signer policy around approved OS kernels. Another paradigm we can potentially leverage uh, is the, the notion of runtime measurement registers. Uh, and so these are akin to how you think of virtual TPM PCRs. So essentially, the OS, the application, and the system firmware can potentially just extend measurements uh, and log those measurements as part of uh, runtime measurements available as part of the uh, CPU architecture. Right? These RTMRs, RTMRs are reflected as part of your attestation reports, and so are bettable. Uh, and these allows uh, uh, RTMRs to allow a lot more flexibility. So this allows these less extend measurements multiple times. Uh, if you look at the hardware support, TDX uh, supports this natively, and they have four RTMRs available. Uh, if you look at SEV SNP, uh, similar paradigms as such as RTMRs can be built with isolated firmware uh, 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 within SEV SNP. Uh, and so these would become potentially virtual RTMRs available for the deployments. Right. So this is essentially the design we have been exploring for simplified firmware for confidential VMs. Um, if you look at the implementation choices, there are several implementation choices here. Uh, we can potentially look at simplified UFI, right? So a UFI uh, purpose built to uh, be to have no secure boot, no hard dependency on a virtual TPM deployments, potentially may depend on RTMRs. Um, uh, in this case, then we will rely on CPU attestation and measured boot 
to capture the identity and integrity of the confidential VM, right? That aligns with what we set out to do as part of our requirements. Uh, and the auditing of uh, of this particular firmware requires familiarity, familiarity with UFI code uh, and development, uh, uh, with, which is a narrower uh, set of people. But at the same time, as long as everything is open source and reproducible, we can offer uh, uh, transparency and uh, uh, let customers make uh, let users make uh, uh, informed choices. The other option we have been exploring, uh, and we'll talk about it as part of the next part of the presentation, is can we have Linux as firmware? Can we, in fact, leverage Linux itself as the bootloader to boot the operating system? Um, there are certain benefits based on this. So Linux is already in the TCB, right? And so we are not potentially dramatically extending the TCB. You're running it already as part of the OS. Can we use it as the firmware uh, available? And then it also allows for increasing the spectrum of auditability because potentially every Linux developer can now be a potential firmware auditor auditor for your confidential VM deployment, right? And so with that, uh, I would like to transfer to Raghavan, uh, who will talk about Linux as firmware. All right, thanks, Pushkar. Let me share my screen to get it. There you go. All right. So uh, Linux as firmware, right? So the idea of using Linux as firmware is uh, is nothing new. I mean, there's been a couple of projects that's done this kind of uh, experimental work, projects like Linux boot, Linux BIOS and Core Boot. I mean, Core Boot is uh, eventually settled at, I mean, from uh, Linux BIOS. They're uh, technically based on a Linux uh, you know, a kernel, right? And uh, you know, to discuss about you know, Linux as firmware, uh, you know, we need to uh, you know, talk about uh, uh, you know how UEFI is actually uh, you know a functional uh, in the former environment because Linux would actually place in that space and uh, you know if you talk about UEFI interfaces you know ideally it has like four uh, you know boots in four different phases right the first second uh, PA phase uh, which performs the platform initialization setting up the you know uh, the temporary uh, stack and the CPU uh, cache and uh, the PEI, which initializes the uh, the RAM and the CPU and other uh, platform modules, right? So, uh, and then the uh, Dixie phase comes in. So Dixie phase is where you know, a bunch of drivers getting loaded into, into the UFI environment, providing the runtime for the rest of the uh, you know, uh, services to run within the UFI runtime. Now, what Linux boot does is basically, it technically replaces a major portion of uh, UFI environment with a, a bootloader, I mean, with a kernel loader and a Linux kernel and a, a, and a init RAM bus, right? So what this does is basically uh, the Dixie uh, phase, which uh, you know brings in this custom drivers are now replaced with the drivers that actually comes in within the uh, kernel. And if you look at the, the, the UEFI drivers that how much of audibility, audibility that goes into uh, Dixie drivers compared to the uh, Linux drivers, it's much more uh, wider, uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of the eyes that goes into the Linux drivers. Right? So that is the problem that actually Linux uh, boot is trying to solve in, in one way. And uh, the, uh, the Linux kernel at, uh, loaded as a firmware, which then uses uh, a syscall uh, called kexec, which loads the operating system kernel, right? And uh, so this is the uh, the crux of Linux boot. And uh, if you look at the flexibility of uh, Linux boot as such, it can work with multiple platforms, like say uh, UFI or Core Boot. If you implement a native uh, a platform specific uh, kernel loader, which can technically you know, uh, transfer it to a uh, traditional uh, uh, Linux kernel, and then an interim so that gives you an environment to run a native Linux application within the format. So, so that's what I mean, that inspires us to, you know, why not? Can we think about a similar idea, similar design for uh, using an environment to run in a uh, guest firm, right? Now, to, to do this, we need, I mean, we have the kernel. Obviously, we need a init RAM of us, a system to, uh, to provide an execution environment. So, so this is where we took this project as a case study to find, you know, how uroot can be used in this environment. Because what Uroot does is basically it provides, uh, it gives you an environment to run. So Uroot is basically uh, uh, from this cache implementation on uh, of uh, initramfs in Go. Uh, it's quite similar to BusyBox kind of uh, implementation where it provides a single binary system and symbolic links to all the tools, right? And uh, since it is Go, uh, you have the memory safety and parallelization that comes along with a Go language. And uh, you have the the Uroot uh, 
which is a single binary system and uh, you load on top of uh, the Linux kernel here. So this is the uh, idea of like now instead of running a Dixie driver, a native application, now you have a Go program that can actually run in, in your uh, uh, firmware. Right? So that's the flexibility that we, we want to uh, you know uh, experiment in this case. And in this reference implementation, I'm going to show you how we implemented the multi-stage, uh, the, the, the secure chain uh, imp implementation. So uh, if I mean, in, in this implementation, we have like uh, you know, a two-stage approach where the uh, the firmware is the stage one, and then the operating system uh, kernel is the stage two. So uh, when the uh, as part of the uh, the, the, the domain uh, the virtual domain creation, hypervisor initializes the uh, guest memory. So that has the memory layout of the kernel and the init MFS created by the hypervisor. And that locks in the pages, and which, which is actually added part of the measurement of the hardware report. And once the kernel, I mean, once the platform is initialized part of the uh, VM creation, the kernel gets loaded and uh, uh, with the minimal support. So this kernel, what we built uh, for the uh, firmware, uh, doesn't have uh, doesn't have to have uh, you know uh, much of the uh, device support. It's a very minimalistic kernel uh, that you could actually have hardened and uh, with, with, with static devices set up and which doesn't have to be dependent on the hypervisor uh, device creation uh, dynamically. And once the kernel is loaded, you have the uh, uh, you know uh, actually init MFS being getting loaded. And uh, so the init MFS the primary job is to basically now at this point is to get the hardware report from the platform that is running on. So this hardware report is going to contain your, uh, you know, measurements of the configuration that Pushkar uh, uh, talked about. So that configuration will have the measurements of the rest of the system. Now, what we're able to load here uh, so, uh, could be uh, the config data measurement and the kernel measurement and the unit time uh, measurement. So once this is validated, and uh, so this is like a customizable. So you, you could implement all of this in a Go program, and uh, at, at the end of the validation technically is going to invoke a k-exec. So k-execing into, so what k-exec does is basically it maps the uh, secondary kernel uh, as the uh, primary kernel uh, uh, segments. And then it loads the, uh, once you provide the init RAM of us, it jumps into the secondary kernel, uh, leaving uh, uh, all, the, all, the, uh, all the pages of the primary kernel, right? So the secondary kernel gets loaded into memory and, uh, the, uh, and uh, along with its uh, uh, you know, in-tram So this is the traditional in-tram that any guest VM uh, will be configured, right? Now, at this point of time, the firmware is actually flush out of memory in the sense like we're not, I mean, th there's no runtime services like UFI, but the idea is to basically provide an execution environment where you uh, perform, uh, where you apply the boot policies uh, to do this uh, uh, secure boot chain. And once the in tram is loaded, this is where you get the opportunity to apply the secondary validation. So suppose you have your uh, disk integrity check, or uh, you have the uh, disk encryption uh, uh, you know, feature, or uh, you connect to the external services, because this kernel has the uh, you know, uh, full device support. Now you load it with network, load with external devices support, you could actually connect to uh, you know, a, a key management service to, to, uh, to get the extended validation. And once that is uh, you know, performed, you get into the uh, you know, operating system uh, uh, in it, so technically you launch your application or OS demands or cloud in it. The, the, the I mean the flow continues from there on, right? So with this, I'm, I'm going to show you a demo of this uh, reference implementation. Uh, so it's going to be a quick demo. I, I'll, I'll walk through uh, with the demo uh, quickly. Let me. All right. All right, so I have this demo uh, on a uh, on a chemo system. It's not a, a, a real uh, uh, hardware, but I'll, I'll walk through uh, the flow uh, in this case. So what just happened uh, right now is I've launched uh, chemo with my former kernel. Um, let me just skip to the top. Yeah, so I've just launched uh, my former kernel and the init RAM of us, uh, which uh, which is built on U root and a couple of uh, command lines. So once the kernel is loaded, uh, we could see that we get into uh, the U root. So this is where your uh, you know validation, the firmware validation uh, uh, gets kicks in. So it fetches the hardware report initially, and then the measurements from the, uh, uh, from the config validates the configuration, uh, 
And once the configuration is valid for this, for the sake of this demo, I've actually put it into the shell of the firmware. So technically you would, you wouldn't do this. You would actually pass on to the stage two at this point of time. So just to show how the, uh, you know, the firmware shell, uh, and then, uh, the some uh, firmware binaries, I wanted to, uh, show, uh, get into the shell to show you guys the binary. Right. So if you look at the tools that what we built, it's all a single binary and all the tools are just a symbolic link to the uh, BC box uh, kind of a tool that's built on Go. And it's just a minimalistic uh, runtime environment where I mean, except in it. So in this case, the init actually launched a shell, uh, a, a lightweight shell. But, uh, I mean, once if I exit from here, uh, the init is actually still, uh, you know, performing the rest of the uh, operation. So in this case, it's going to invoke uh, KXAC to load the secondary kernel, uh, which was validated a part of the uh, init and uh, remove the pass. So there's a DM verity uh, a kind of in integrity uh, check is being performed and uh, you get it to the shell, right? So technically at this point of time, you have the application uh, loaded uh, from there on. So that's the demo I wanted to show, uh, getting back to the, uh, getting back to my own screen. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, at this point, uh, you, you have the application loaded and uh, available for uh, execution. So I'll, I'll, I'll transfer my, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I'll transfer it to Pushkar uh, for his uh, conclusions on uh, execution. Pushkar, you can take it on. Yeah. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Okay. So, uh, essentially, uh, I think we want to call out that Linux boot as a CVM firmware candidate uh, well, makes sense, right? The scope is for scenarios which require a simplified bootloader, uh, potentially without runtime services, right? So the scope is not for every scenario. There are certain scenarios which would require different kinds of firmware, right? But the core notion is that we should start uh, exploring choices around system firmware and options for uh, users to choose as they deploy their workloads. Uh, the benefits of Linux boot specifically come down to the fact that, you know, auditability build is built. Right? All Linux devs, developers are potentially firmware auditors uh, and potentially even contributors. Um, the OSS builds are all reproducible for both kernel and Linux boot, right? So you, if you look at uh, the U root, uh, right, everything is reproducible. Everything can be reflected back to a dedicated hash, uh, 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 you know, with a, with a well-known source code and tools. Um, it potentially also helps us limit the TCB further because Linux is already part of the OS TCB uh, and potentially adding uh, another variant of Linux or another Linux with a different uh, kernel config does not extend your uh, TCB dramatically. Uh, more importantly, even the drivers which are used for the OS and firmware can be shared, right? So uh, that further improves the, the notion around quality and uh, TCB. Uh, Uroot, which we showcased here as part of the demo, is written in Go. So we get uh, additional benefits such as memory safety, uh, potentially even get some performance benefits using parallelization, even though that is not the real scope of, uh, you know, why we're exploring Linux boot. Um, so as conclusion, uh, system firmware is important, uh, important for all VMs and especially confidential VMs. Uh, VM and uh, confidential VM users uh, should be empowered to select their system firmware for their deployments, right? Um, and we think that Linux boot is aligned specifically well for scenarios where we would like to focus on low TCB, uh, focus on transparency and auditability, and there is no hard requirement for runtime services. So that essentially concludes our presentation. Uh, we are open for questions.